This is the gun used in the most high profile assassination in recent memory. Well, it's not actually the literal gun Luigi Mangione allegedly used to kill United Healthcare CEO Brian Thompson. But it is the exact model of firearm, and we made it with just a 3D printer and some parts ordered off the internet. Some people call this a ghost gun because no government agency has any record of its existence. I didn't get a background check or show ID. No gun control at all. I'm Andy Greenberg. I investigate the strange, dark, and subversive corners of the internet for Wired. This is Hack Lab. I made Luigi Mangione's gun. As a journalist, I've covered the digital DIY gun making scene since the beginning. In 2013, I was there for the very first test of the first fully 3D printed gun, the Liberator. A couple of years later, I even built an untraceable AR-15 ghost gun in Wired's office to test just how far the tech had come. That was 10 years ago. Then, when Luigi Mangione was arrested in an Altoona, Pennsylvania McDonald's late last year, I wrote a news piece about the gun found in his backpack. According to the DIY gunsmiths I spoke to, it seemed to be a Chairman Wan V1, a tweak of a popular, partially 3D printed Glock style design known as the FMDA 19.2, an acronym that stands for the libertarian slogan, free men don't ask. So I wanted to know how easy is it for someone to build a deadly and untraceable weapon like this now? Has the law finally caught up with the reality of ghost guns? To find out, I decided to make one. So I went to Araby, Louisiana, to a gun range outside New Orleans, owned by James Reeves, an attorney and a popular YouTuber. James, nice to meet you. Our experiment here that we're trying to do is to actually 3D print Luigi Mangione's gun, just like he did. Allegedly. Uh, allegedly, thank you. But my question for you first as a lawyer is, is all of this actually legal? Totally legal, but it depends on the purpose. So if you're making a firearm for yourself, there's no prohibition in the Gun Control Act of 1968 that would prevent you from making a gun for yourself. If you're making it for someone else, if you're selling them, distributing, totally different story. You've got to have a license. A lot of states have made this illegal, but here in Louisiana, like we're still good to go. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We have free country down here in the great state of Louisiana. Over the years, the U.S. government has certainly tried to regulate 3D printed and other kinds of ghost guns. After Cody Wilson released printable files for the Liberator online, the government ordered his company, Defense Distributed, to take them down. By 2018, Cody Wilson briefly won a legal fight to repost them on his website, but multiple states sued, shutting it down again. Then in 2022, the Biden administration really tightened regulations, requiring serial numbers and background checks for ghost gun kits, commercially available packages of parts which are designed to make it easy to finish and assemble a working gun. That led to legal challenges which were settled in March with the Supreme Court decision upholding those new regulations. But if you're not using one of those kits, it's really only state laws that restrict making ghost guns, and they vary really widely. New York enforces strict rules on self-made guns requiring serial numbers on the receivers. California even prohibits the sale of 3D printers if they're intended to make a gun. But for the rest of the United States in between, including Louisiana, where we are now, it's still essentially the Wild West for DIY firearms. While the legal battle has gone back and forth, the technology has just kept relentlessly advancing. Since the first 3D printed gun parts began to surface online in 2012 and 2013, we've seen an explosion of digital DIY firearms. Fully or partially printable rifles, AR-15, and even fully automatic printable machine guns. And thanks to a very committed community of online gunsmiths, many of whom are bent on defeating gun control, that evolution is still continuing. The first step to building the gun allegedly used by Mangione was easy. I found the gun plans online in minutes. Certain file sharing sites are packed with DIY firearm blueprints, detailed instructions, everything. In states like California or New Jersey, parts of this gun printing process, even sharing the files is illegal. But in Louisiana, no such law. In fact, according to US gun control laws, only one component known as the frame of a Glock style pistol is considered the gun. If I make that part myself, say with a 3D printer, and I combine it with commercially bought components for the rest of the weapon, I can basically circumvent all regulations. So armed with a shopping list and a credit card, we ordered everything we needed. A 3D printer, plastic filaments, and household products like epoxy were all just a few clicks away on sites like Lowe's or Amazon. And the more specialized components were available on sites that sell gun parts, just not the guns themselves. A few days later, every ingredient I needed to make Mangione's gun arrived in the mail for the grand total of $1,144.67 plus shipping. And that includes the price of the 3D printer. This is like Christmas Day. This looks like a slide, very much like an obvious gun part. 
kind of crazy that you can just order this. So it's kind of like a very interesting and fun technical challenge, but I keep having to remind myself not only that we're making a lethal weapon, but that I'm also potentially retracing the steps of an alleged murderer who carried out exactly this process. 3D printers work by extruding heated plastic filament through a nozzle layer by layer to slowly create the object. We're gonna print two frames just to be sure. Printing these two frames will take about 13 hours, which is pretty quick. Back when Cody Wilson, a pioneer in the DIY gun movement, printed the Liberator, the original one-shot, 100% 3D printed pistol in 2013, 3D printers were much slower, and the materials were pretty unreliable by comparison and cracked easily. When Cody Wilson tested that first ever 3D printed gun, he was concerned that it might blow up in his hands. He even used a string to pull the trigger for the first time. To some degree, I'm still a little worried about that, to be honest. DIY gun fails are still pretty common. When I made an AR-15 in Wired's office in 2015, a gunsmith warned me the frame of the gun that I had made wouldn't be reliable enough and recommended I use an aluminum lower receiver I'd made with a computer-controlled milling machine instead. We're about to see how much that question of reliability has changed over the years. Okay, let's get started. Hopefully this whole experiment will literally blow up in my face. The next morning, I returned to check on the 3D printed frames. This is pretty wild. Like these things look like actual gun parts. So this looks like a big block, but all of this is support structure that just holds up the top of the frame here. So once I crack this off, oh yeah. I don't need to even clean anything out of this internal cavity here. This just looks almost like commercially made. It's so clean on the inside. It's just really impressive what a 3D printer can do today, overnight. So the frame is done. Now it's time to assemble this gun. I know from experience that it's tricky assembling a gun from scratch. There are lots of little pieces, and to be honest, I have no idea what I'm doing. So that's why I've reached out to a DIY gun expert and YouTuber who calls himself Print Shoot Repeat. He prefers to keep his face covered to preserve his anonymity. So what do you think of this 3D printed nine millimeter frame? It looks beautiful. It's very excellent print quality. So how do we get started? So do you see that hole there? I saw the hole at the bottom, yeah. 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 So you are a 3D printed gun aficionado. What is it about these things that appeals to you? I think the thing I like the most about it, aside from exercising your constitutional rights, which is awesome, but you're able to make guns that you can't buy. There are these really cool, intricate, neat designs that people create and test that you can make that you actually can't purchase in a store, but also to be anonymous and private with your gun making. But there's also this element to 3D printed guns that somebody who's mentally ill or a felon or Luigi Mangione can, you know, fabricate their own gun and go out and commit a crime with it. I mean, how do you, how do you feel about that? Freedom is ultimately dangerous. There's no way to stop people from hurting each other, unfortunately. I don't love that people commit crimes and kill each other with guns, but they are designed for killing. I'm not gonna d deny that, but we live in a country that is relatively free when it comes to a lot of our laws and especially the Second Amendment. It is so. kind of remarkable, the precision of this. It seems like a commercial piece. Yeah, the design of this particular pistol was so good in 2020 that it's still the go-to Glock style frame. It's open source and designers can take the raw blueprint of this thing and then add their own tweaks to it. If you really were like a lone wolf killer trying to make this thing alone in your garage, where would you learn this? Or if you were just someone who was into building guns and not a lone wolf killer, sure. but there are assembly videos, uh, particularly like the sites where you download some of the files, but it's a lot of trial and error. The slide to me is like shocking to even look at. It's like, I can't believe this is just a component of a gun. And so it's just strange that like the regulated part is not the part that holds the round. Yep, that's per the ATF. The ATF decided yeah. that, so thanks ATF. This can be challenging because what can happen is the rear rails sometimes don't line up perfectly. Yep, now pull it back as hard as you can. I let it go. All right, now we got our gun. And just make sure you don't point it at anyone. <laughs> I see the empty chamber. Yep. And now we're gonna put in one of these magazines. And which one do you think we should use? What I found on the evidence photograph, there was two magazines. One was a Glock 17 magazine, which holds 17 rounds versus a Glock 19 magazine. This is a Magpul P mag. This one had jacketed hollow points in it. Uh, going off that, I would say we should stick this one in. This is essentially Luigi Mangione's gun, but uh, we're still missing one component. Yes, critical component. Which is the suppressor. Exactly. 
Suppressors, also known as silencers, have been highly regulated under the National Firearms Act since 1934, and 3D printing one without a certain kind of gun-making license would be a serious felony. Since James has that license, he's going to do it for us. So it's quite a process to legally own and possess a suppressor. The second you print out a suppressor at home, felony, prison, so it's a very serious deal. 3D printed suppressors are a relatively new phenomenon, and the technology to make ones like the FTN suppressor, allegedly found on Mangione, has come a long way in a very short time. So the suppressor is printing, and it looks like it's gonna take another three and a half hours. Yeah, it smells a little bit like a, like a burning vacuum cleaner. When this is done, we actually have to fill out a couple set of federal forms. After a few more hours of 3D printing, we had our suppressor. We wrapped it in hockey tape, just as Luigi Mangione allegedly did. So I think we're now ready to put this thing together, right? Yeah, go right ahead, thread it on. Once I screwed it onto the barrel of our gun, we had the complete configuration he was accused of using as a murder weapon. This thing just got at least like twice as scary. Before heading to the range to test it, I wanted to get the gun control side of the story. So I spoke to Nick Saplina at the nonprofit Every Town for Gun Safety. 3D guns are a whole new ballgame. I think 3D printed guns are about to have their moment. I've covered this world of 3D printed guns since 2013. And back then, you know, I wrote about this believing it was kind of a science fictional future phenomenon. And I do not think this is a future problem. ATF estimated that between 2016 and 2022, over 70,000 ghost guns were recovered at crime scenes across the country. And the technology has really come of age. The printers are better, the materials are better, and the designs are better. There are models of gun that have come out in the last few years. These almost fully 3D printed semi-automatic rifles that truly look like something out of science fiction that are really powerful and really accurate. One of the things that has developed over the last decade or more is a community of creators and sharing designs and improving upon each other's designs. And a lot of that are values that creators, I think, really can embrace. But we can't lose sight that this is about firearms. You have a right to personal protection, but when you're purposefully creating firearms that are flooding communities uh, with illegal firearms that are used in crimes, and when we're innovating to make them harder to regulate, you have to ask yourself the question, just how serious is this community about doing their part to protect the community? I mean, we have seen already that you can actually have most of the parts of the firearm be fully 3D printed. That is the state of the art right now, and that is going to be the next chapter of the ghost gun problem in this country. I might look calm on the surface, but to be honest, I'm sweating a little bit. It's a strange moment when this kind of abstract and technical series of steps finally comes together, and you remember that you've created something really powerful and quite dangerous. In fact, the exact gun that appears to have killed a man on the streets of Manhattan last year. So for this first shot, I'm gonna just hold it to the side from the hip, just in case this slide flies off the 3D printed frame and goes backwards at a high speed. Moment of truth. Wow. How'd we do? Intact? Totally flawless, yeah. Nice. Decently quiet for uh, supersonic ammunition as well. Well, let's load it up again. All right. Another misfire. So I guess what's happening here is that the suppressor is preventing it from cycling properly? Yes, what's happening is the slide's coming forward, but probably not quite enough to strike the primer and then cause a detonation downrange. But we did get a couple there. So I want to kind of give it a, a shot yeah. and see if I can break it in a little bit. As we saw in the CT camera video, he was going like this after every shot, hitting the back of the slide like you did correctly. But I, I want to actually see if this is going to function without the suppressor attached. Let's do that, let's take it off. Okay. In a normal semi-automatic Glock, the upper part of the gun, known as its slide, which retracts with every shot, resets the trigger and loads a new round into the chamber. In the video of Thompson's murder, the gun, allegedly fired by Mangione, appears not to have functioned. That's a result of the suppressor attachment preventing that rechambering. And yet, the CEO killer in the CCTV video didn't panic or stop to diagnose his ghost gun's apparent malfunctioning. He reacted quickly, racking the gun, shooting it, and racking again, as if he knew exactly how the weapon he had made would perform. 
Had the assassin practiced with his gun at a range to break it in? Had he, in fact, engaged in exactly the type of troubleshooting we were doing right now? Not everything works, and so you gotta do a little bit of filing sometimes. We've done a little bit of modifications. We're gonna see if it runs semi-automatic. You take it for a yeah. spin. It's so close now. Oh, there we go. Oh, there it is, yep. Here you can see that when we take off the suppressor, the gun functions as a truly semi-automatic firearm. All right, let's try the suppressor. Let's do it. So we got the suppressor on, we made some modifications to the barrel and the slide. Hopefully it'll run. You were manually racking it, but just like we saw in the video of Brian Thompson's killing. And to be clear, like the thing that we had to file was not the 3D printed part. It was this kind of slightly crappy commercial part. You know, I imagine that for allegedly Mangione himself, he probably had similar kind of hiccups and then probably did take a file to it at some point. Indeed, and it seemed like he knew that it was going to malfunction in the way that we just saw and was ready for that malfunction to happen. Right. In my hands is the gun that allegedly killed CEO Brian Thompson. The same Glock style pistol, same parts, same suppressor. As I squeezed the trigger and racked the gun in the exact same way the killer allegedly did, I felt the same explosive recoil he would have. And it drove home the disturbing realization that our experiment in building a lethal, uncontrollable weapon had been a success. What kind of law or regulation or do you actually imagine could get a grip on this issue? The key part of this is to make breaking the law harder. And the way you make breaking the law harder is to focus on the 3D printers and the sort of uh, firmware and software that make them work. We've been here before with money counterfeiting and the software companies like the Adobe's of the world detect whether you are trying to print currency. You can't do it. We're starting to have conversations with the folks behind these printing companies that are like, yeah, we can detect it and we can stop our printer from printing. I can already imagine the incredible backlash to any effort to kind of put DRM on 3D printers or try to just restrict computers, essentially, that people own. I'm in the business of trying to save lives. And the fact of the matter is gun violence is the number one killer of children and teens in this country. And there's lots of room for legal ownership, for even maybe legal printing. But the idea that we're going to sort of sit this one out because the crypto anarchists have won is not going to happen. Uh, and they're going to find that those of us in the gun safety debate have a lot of fight in us as well. I've successfully made a ghost gun. Now I have a problem. I can't legally take it back to New York where I live and I can't legally leave it here in Louisiana or give it to someone else either. So I'm going to turn in the parts I made to the local police. Hopefully they're not gonna to ask too many questions. I think we've proven that a dozen years after I first started writing about 3D printed guns, it's actually easier than ever before to use digital tools to build a deadly weapon with total privacy and impunity in most of the United States, despite every effort by gun control advocates. Until that changes, and as 3D printing technology keeps getting better, it's safe to say we're going to see more ghost guns in the world and more people, like a certain CEO killer, ready to use them. Thank <music> you.